Simone. Telencephalon, but when we de develop into a person, it is the cerebrum. And so for us, the forebrain is the cerebrum and the diencephalon. The hindbrain is going to be the cerebellum, the rest of the brain stem. That's going to be our hindbrain. So the, the diencephalon, we learned this in the lab, there were three primary parts. And so we have the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. So the thalamus is going to be the one with the bump on it. Remember, that, that's where I always start. Find the bump. That is going to be the thalamus. And so this is kind of right in the center. So there's part of it on the left and the right hand side. And this is, by, this is by far the biggest part of the diencephalon. So it's about four fifths of that diencephalon. And there's actually two halves. So that's what the bump is. The bump is just the connection between the two halves. So we've cut our brain in half, it's a cross section, 
and so you just cut right across where they connect. So there's this little projection that connects the two together. The thalamus is considered the point where the things, signals below our brain pass through to get up to our brain. It's also going to be where things pass to get from our brain down to the rest of our body. And so it's going to be very, very important in controlling our muscles. That is we're going to be where signals coming out of our brain down to our body are primarily going to be going is to our muscles. And so the thalamus is going to be very, very important in motor control. It also plays a uh, function in memory and emotion. It's, it's part of the limbic system, which has its own slides coming up later. But the thalamus has also part of that. So the hypothalamus is the little area right below the thalamus. So it is actually the walls of the third ventricle. So imagine that model of the ventricles that we have in the lab, and the walls that make up that ventricle are actually the outside of the hypothalamus. And so the, the ventricle is going to be the space between the parts of the hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus, there are, so just below hypothalamus is what's called the mammillary body. And each mammillary body has three or four mammillary nuclei. So the mammillary nuclei are going to take signals from the limbic system, which is going to be primarily learning and emotions. We'll see that. And it's going to send be the link between the hypothalamus and the thalamus for that. There's also what's called the infundibulum, fun to say, is this part, anyway, it's the little stalk here that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. So this is the pituitary gland here, there's a little stalk that hangs off the hypothalamus, that stop is the infundibulum. So the hypothalamus is going to be a major part of the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. So the autonomic nervous system is going to be controlling the more or less non-voluntary functions of our body, like our heart and our breathing. And what, what, that is next week's lecture. Next week's lecture is all on the autonomic nervous system. Hypothalamus is part of that. And it's also going to play a role in the endocrine system. And so the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system are the two big systems that are going to control homeostasis in our body. And so the hypothalamus, its primary purpose is going to be to keep us in homeostasis is going to try to prevent large changes from happening. It's going to do that. It's going to, it's going to control a number of different glands, the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland puts out a, a whole bunch of different hormones with a wide range of functions. The biggest one, probably the most famous one, is a role in growth. When we're little, our growth is caused by the pituitary gland. But the pituitary gland also plays a role in our metabolism, reproduction, and also our response to stress. It's also going to play a role in labor contractions and other parts of the birthing process. Also, water conservation. So it's going to have a connection to our kidneys. So that's completely separate from its autonomic effects. So it's also going to affect heart rate, blood pressure, our gastrointestinal tract, the motility of our gastrointestinal tract. And this is all coming from this little tiny area of the brain. Remember, the thalamus is four fifths of the diencephalon. So the hypothalamus, at the most, is one fifth of this tiny little area of our brain. And it's controlling all of these different functions. 
also controls thermoregulation, food and water intake. It's going to be what makes us hungry. It's going to be what makes us say that we've had enough. Mine apparently doesn't work all that well. <laughs> it's also going to be to tell our body that we're thirsty. It's going to tell us whether we need to drink. It's going to do that by monitoring how the concentration of things in our blood. Tonicity was a term that we used a while ago. It's how concentrated things like salts and sugars are in our blood. And so our body can look at those things and say, if the concentration is too high, we must have lost a bunch of water. Because we know we didn't gain a whole bunch of those salts. We must have lost water. And so we're going to drink. Also, think of it the opposite way. What if, instead of losing water, we did in fact gain a bunch of salt? If you eat a bunch of salty Doritos, what's it going to make you want to do? Drink water. You get that salt into your blood. It's going to make the salt concentration in your blood go up. Your body's going to say, I need to get extra water in there to dilute that salt. And so it's going to make you thirsty. Also, going to play a role in sleep, in circadian rhythm. If we come back here, we have the pineal gland. So the pineal gland was on the diagram that we had in the lab. Pineal gland secretes melatonin. Melatonin is what makes you sleepy and controls your biological clock. So it's controlling that. It's going to play a role in the memory because it's connected to the mam mammillary nuclei. It's also going to be a big role, play a big role in our emotions. This is all just a tiny little one-fifth of our diencephalon. So these are, you don't need to know these, but this is the hypothalamus, and there are different parts of it that have these different functions. So it's not like there's just one big chunk that does all of it. If you really break it down, there's little pieces of it that each have their own function. But you don't need to know the names of those or what they do. <coughs> so there's also the epithalamus. So there's the thalamus, hypothalamus, and then there's the epithalamus. But the epithalamus is very small. And so it is actually the pineal gland. So the hypothalamus is going to have some control on the pineal gland, but the pineal gland itself is part of the epithalamus. Don't worry about, about that. But the epithalamus is just this tiny little part in the back. That, that's the diencephalon. The rest of our forebrain was the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is the vast majority of our brain. This is going to be where our senses are received. This is going to be a lot of the thinking, the, the, the problem solving part of our brain. And so the senses are going to come up here, they're going to solve the problem, they're going to send the motor signal back out. So remember, we have two hemispheres, the corpus callosum holding them together. We have the gyri and the sulci. And then each hemisphere has our different lobes. So we have the frontal, occipital, parietal, temporal. I think I said occipital. <laughs> well, the book, the first one says the insula. Mm -hmm. um, does it not go back far? Where is that, that diagram that you say? Ah, that's this one called Cheryl. 
So I had five, but my five were different than the book's five. I had gone forward one. Okay. So we have the five lobe, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, and the insula. I think in the, the lab there was a, a diagram where there's a kind of like a little tool, they were pulling one back, they're pulling back the temporal lobe, I think, and they were showing the lobe hidden down in there. So the frontal lobe is the most rostral lobe, it's in the front, and it has a they all have a, a large number of functions. I, I wouldn't spend time learning which functions are in which lobes specifically. I think I would know I would know that these are in the cerebrum. So the frontal has a, a lot of functions. Primarily is going to be the motor functions. Parietal is going to be general senses. Occipital is going to be the visual. Temporal is going to be some of the other special senses. And then the insula, the one that's hidden down in the bottom, is going to play a role in the spoken language. Here we go. This is what I was thinking. So it's pulling back the frontal to show the insula hidden down. So we need to have connections in our brain. One part of our brain needs to be able to talk to the rest of our brain. And so we're going to have connections called tracks. And so on these diagrams, I've made the word bigger for the ones that you need. So there's going to be three types of tracks. There's association tracks, projection tracks, and commissural tracks. So projection tracks are going to go vertically between high and low brain. So these are these yellow ones. For you, it probably just looks like the whole area is yellow, but they're actually yellow lines going vertically from the surface of the brain down towards the center of the brain. There are commissural tracks. These are going to go sideways one hemisphere to another. So down here, if we look at the brain from the top, these commissural tracks are going left to right. It's going to allow one hemisphere to talk to the next. And then there's association tracks, which are going to connect regions within a hemisphere. So here are the association tracks. So imagine this is connecting this part of the brain to that part of the brain. It's in the same hemisphere, but it's a different area. And so association tracks are going to connect those together. The tracks themselves are bundles of nerve fibers. We're going to have a bunch of neurons, a bunch of nerves coming together. And they're going to form this track. So it's going to allow a lot of information to pass through very quickly. We need to allow that mad the, the information to pass quickly because we need to think quickly. We need to take all that information that's coming into our brain and make an idea out of it, make a decision based on that idea, and then send the motor signals back out to our body. And so we need to be able to connect the gray matter on the surface of our brain with the white matter in the center of our brain. And so there's actually going to be a number of different types of neurons that are going to be connected end to end. And you don't need to know the specific types of, of cells. You just need to realize that what we have are neurons up here, connecting the neurons here to here to here to here to here, allowing that information to pass from the surface down into the center of our brain. Neural integration, 
which we said is where that thought process is actually made, is going to happen in the gray matter. So we need to take information from our senses, which is going to come up our brain stem into the center of our brain, take it out to the gray matter, where the integration is done, and then the command needs to come back to down into the center of the brain, back down the spinal cord, out to our, our muscles. And so the outside, where that gray matter is, is called the cerebral cortex. And it's only about two to three millimeters thick. It's not very thick at all. The majority of our brain is going to be white matter. But of that, neo, of that cerebral cortex, nine-tenths of it, or 90%, is what's called neocortex. And so most other primates and mammals and animals will not have is part of the brain. It's called the neocortex because it evolved recently. This is going to be the big difference between us and all the other animals. It was what makes us human. That's what really is going to separate us apart. It's what's going to allow us to think like humans that other animals cannot do. So that is our forebrain. Then we're going to move to our midbrain. Midbrain was part of the brainstem. If you can imagine that model of the, of the brainstem, one of those parts was the midbrain. It's actually going to be wrapped around the cerebral aqueduct. And it contains two cranial nerves, that, and they're both going to control the eye movements. So cranial nerve three, which is the ocular motor, and cranial nerve four, which was the trochlear. That was the midbrain. Midbrain is not very big. It's its own little thing. It doesn't do a ton compared to some of the other things. Moving further back, the hindbrain, we have the cerebellum. And so, cerebellum plays a huge role in our movement. It's motor coordination and locomotion. But it's also, we're now finding that it plays an even larger role in emotion in speech and other things and senses. And so a long time ago, people realized before they could hook up an EKG to people's brain and see what things were doing, they realized that if someone had an improper cerebellum, if they say, say they had an injury to the back bottom of their head and they knew what was damaged, they saw that these people don't have the correct movement in their body. So they were able to tell that this is what was being controlled by the cerebellum. But now that we can, can hook an EKG up, and we can show people pictures, and have them move and things, and see what parts of their brain light up with activity, now we know that it does all of these different things. So I'm not gonna go through them all. You don't have to memorize all of them, but just take a quick look through these. There's a lot of things that that cerebellum does. And if you go through, it looks like a lot of them are going to be the basic functions of life, right? And so a lot of the other things, imagine we didn't have the cerebrum. We could, at least on paper, still get by. So the cerebrum is gonna be those extra things. And so if you compare the cerebellum to the brain of a lesser animal, their brain as a whole is going to be more like the cerebellum. Even though things like a rat or a mouse still have a cerebrum and cerebellum, the cerebrum is not going to be as advanced as ours. And so their whole brain is more or less going to do a lot of these things. Yeah. Is the cerebellum what they kind of refer to when they say lizard brain? Lizard brain is not a t technical term, so I don't. Reptilian? Like the difference between yeah, I mean, I, I, I know, I know what you're saying. Yeah. What, what they mean by that? I don't know whether they're referring to the cerebellum or the brain stem. Okay. All right. So that's cerebellum. Now we come to our limbic system, which we've mentioned a couple times today. Limbic system is kind of complicated, and it involves pieces that we've already talked about. 
So a piece of this and a piece of that and a piece of that are going to come together in one of their functions is going to be part of the limbic system. And the limbic system is going to be the primary site of emotion and learning. And so there are three main parts of the limbic system. We have the singular gyrus, cingulate gyrus, sorry, which is going to be the very bottom of the cerebrum here. We have the hippocampus, which is this part down here. And then we have the amygdala, which is this. So the three main parts of this big arch, which, which is the cingulate gyrus, and then these two parts down here, the amygdala and the hippo hippocampus. And there are two separate limbic systems. All of these parts are going to exist in both sides of your brain. So in, in with emotion is going to be things like gratification and fear. Where you learn that something is a good thing and where you learn that you need to be afraid of something is going to be due to your limbic system. The limbic system is also going to play a really big part in cognition. So cognition is going to be the intake of knowledge. So think of it as memory. Memory, to me, when I think of memory, I just think of the ability to recall. A cognition is actually taking in information and making sense of it, then to making that into a memory. So we're going to perceive senses. We're going to create thought, reasoning based on those senses. We're going to create judgment based off that. We're going to then store those judgments. Based on their previous judgments, we'll be able to have intuition, say this seems like these other things I've experienced. And so I think this is going to happen. And it's also going to be where our imagination comes from. If you have never experienced anything in your life, how can you imagine something? How many people know figment? Right? Hey, come on. Yeah. Figment. You live in Florida. Yeah, yeah the dragon. Yeah. The purple dragon. Yeah. Now, how many people have the figment song stuck in their head? I hate that dragon. You hate that dragon? I love that dragon. I love dragon. How many people have no idea what I'm talking about? Go to Disney. Go to Epcot. Oh, yeah, Epcot. No, well, this is still Disney. Go to Epcot, part of it. You have to have a spark, right? <laughs> Thank you. So the hippocampus is also part of the limbic system. In the gigantic long list of things the hippocampus did, one of them was memory. One of them was emotion. Those things are part of the limbic system. And so the hippocampus, its role in this process is going to be taking information and consolidating it down into one idea. And so I look around this room and I see your faces on all of you and my hippocampus is saying they're bored. Right? <laughs> and so that is then a short-term memory. So for the rest of the day I'm going to say the class was bored when I was talking about the limbic system. But eventually it's going to be a long-term memory. I'm going to remember classes are always bored when I talk about the limbic system. So this is going to take ideas and turn them into an idea. It's going to turn, turn that into a short-term memory, which is then going to turn into a long-term memory, but it's not going to store the long-term memory itself. It's going to create the long-term memory and then put it into a storage locker. Cerebellum is going to learn motor skills. And so I don't have to think. When I want the slide to go forward, I just click. 
I don't have to think about it. I know if I click that, it goes forward. That's my cerebellum talking. I, I say I want the slide to go forward. My cerebellum says, well, I know how to do that. Click. The amygdala is going to be the emotional memory. So when Parker says he hates figment, <laughs> I'm guessing there was some emotion evolved in that. <laughs> involved in that. There's some emotion that made him hate that, and then hate itself is an emotion. Writing it five times in a row. Writing it five times in a row. <coughs> so, that probably put fear or something, or just annoyance? Annoyance. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you now have that emotional memory in your amygdala. So it's going, the amygdala is going to take in the senses, He's going to see the purple dragon flying around. He's going to hear the figment song playing in his ear. He's going to feel the rage boiling up in his body, right? And so all of those senses are going to go into the amygdala, and then from there into the hypothalamus. And so that is going to make his heart beat faster. It's going to make his blood pressure rise. His hair is going to stand up. <laughs> And then if he rides at me, I didn't even see it coming. <laughs> if you, it's a good thing he didn't ride it six times. Right? Otherwise, maybe, 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 they would have had to shut the ride down for a cleaning. <laughs> so there are two outputs out of the amygdala. One is going to go into the hypothalamus. The other is going to go into the prefrontal cortex, which is going to control the expression of the emotions. So he's sitting there, angry as can possibly be, but he probably didn't scream out with everyone around, Figment, I hate you, <laughs> right? His prefrontal cortex was controlling his expression of his emotions. So that is the limbic system, okay? The limbic system is going to take in sense sensations. And so we have a number of different areas on our brain that are associated with different senses. This is a diagram that I would suggest getting comfortable with. I would know where these different areas are. I think this was in the lab. I would get to know these areas and then know which lobe that they are in. Some of them are obvious. I mean, prefrontal cortex is in the front. It's frontal. Some of the ones that are back here, kind of near the border, I would make sure I knew which lobe that was in. So, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, one of the models is pretty much exactly like that. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. It might be the same exact color, but I don't honestly don't know. I would know if, let's say you had a brain injury, and they said the brain injury was in this part of the brain be able to know which things you think might be affected. Or if you see a patient that has a brain injury in an unknown area, that you know they have a problem with motor control. It might be the primary motor cortex. Or they have something, they have difficulty making an idea out of what they're seeing. They can't figure out what they're seeing. That might be the visual association area back here. So if we, look, actually, if we look at the visual area, the visual association area is a pretty big area. And then next to that is the primary visual cortex. And so the visual cortex is going to be where signal go, where the sensation goes first. This is going to receive the signal. It's going to pass the information into the visual association area, who's going to try then make sense out of that. Part of these, so I guess this is not there than one label here, but you can imagine multimodal association, multimodal association area is going to be something that's going to take information from multiple places and then make one idea of it. 
And so something like the primary visual cortex is for receiving visual signals. What is something up here that you think may receive signals from more than one sense? What are the ones that don't seem to have very specific needs? Broke area. Broke up. And red neck. Do you remember what those do? Speech. Right. And so Vernicki is going to take in speech. Broca is going to turn decide what I want to say back to you. And so, if I'm taking in speech, there's more to it than just my ears, right? What is what else is there to language other than me hearing you speak? Understanding it. Think think lower level. Okay. What other senses? Body, like body language. Body language. I mean, I, I can better understand what you're saying based on your movements. What else? Like the movement of the mouth. Movement of the mouth. If you are having trouble understanding someone, or it's very quiet, you can lip read, right? So you can see their their mouth move, and you can have an idea of what they're saying. Now think, still think about language, but not speech. What is the other form of language other than speech? I didn't even think about sign language. There's sign language. Right. Writing. Right. Mm -hmm. This stuff. This, there, there's no ears involved in this. Right? And so all of that, the, all those senses are coming into your Wernicke area. So that's a mo multimodal association, association area. So we have two types of senses. We have our general senses, and we have our special senses. Special senses are going to have their own lecture at the very end of the semester. But today we're going to just talk a little bit about the general senses. So our general senses are senses that are throughout our body. Our special senses have specific organs like our eyes and our ears devoted to them. But our general senses are going to be things like touch and pressure and stretch and cold and pain, things like that. And then we can take those general senses and break them down further. One more step. We can go cutaneous senses and visceral senses. So cutaneous is everything that has to do with our skin. So the touch and the pain and the temperature sensors in our skin would be our cutaneous senses. And then our visceral senses are going to be related to our internal organs. So hunger, thirst, internal pain, and nausea would be examples of visceral senses. In our head, I mean, we have general senses in our head, right? If I hit my head, I'm going to feel it. For in our head, those general senses are going to be part, and they're going to be carried by cranial nerves. Remember, we had a whole bunch of pairs of cranial nerves. The vast majority of them didn't even get below our neck. Most of them stayed right up in our head. And so all that sensory information in our head is going to be in our cranial nerves. Things in my arm are going to be peripheral. So our precentral gyrus, precentral gyrus is precentral compared to what? Do you remember? The central sulcus. Central sulcus. So we had the central sulcus, which was a, a, a groove kind of running in the middle of the brain horizontally, or from one side to the other. The gyrus in front of that was the precentral gyrus. 
The one below that was the post-central gyrus. So in the pre-central gyrus, this is going to be uh, play a big role in that motor control. And so things are going to be on the top of that gyrus. Things are going to be down, buried down in it. And so things for moving our toes are down in the bottom of that gyrus. The things up on the top of that gyrus are going to control the upper body. So imagine, I honestly don't even know how I would try to draw that. You can all imagine what this gyrus looks like on the brain, hopefully. And so up near the surface of it is going to be things for the upper part of our body, and then buried down in there would be things for the lower part of our body. And then there's also a part of it called the inferior lateral region, which is going to control our facial muscles. Motor homunculus is a weird act. I, I've never seen that term before. I had to look it up. A homunculus is something that looks like a little human. And so apparently somewhere along the line, someone decided that a gyrus from the side looks like a little human. I don't know. I didn't see it. But I left it there because I wanted to tell you a little story. Wikipedia told me that. You know what a homunculus was? Or no, but I'm just saying anyone can hit it. Oh, I see what you're saying. But it, there were multiple, it wasn't just one. So what, what this is saying is that if you look at your little little human, let's try let's look at a let's try to look at a gyrus from the side. So this is kind of a fold. goes down into our brain. So this is the top of our brain. This is the, the inside of our brain. So imagine you have a bunch of these folds nested together, and this is going to make up your brain. So this is one of these gyrus. It's, the reason it's kind of folded is because parts of it are wider than others. And so the wider the part, the more motor muscles it's going to control. And so this part, doesn't need to control that many muscles, so it doesn't need to be very big. This part up here, this part down here, are big because they need to control a large number of muscles. Also important in motor control are the basal nuclei. These are going to be little centers in the brain that are going to be essentially kind of organization centers of these senses, and they're going to send out signals to control our muscles. So these basal nuclei are going to tell my muscles when to start moving, when to stop moving. So one part of my brain may tell my arm that it, you need to move, but the basal nuclei are going to actually initiate that movement, and the basal nuclei are going to stop that movement. The basal nuclei are going to say, start now, stop now. Basal nuclei are also going to control some of the movements that we do constantly, the repetitive movements, things like walking, that you don't even have to think about. Your brain says, I want to go over there, and your legs just respond. It's also going to be your basal nuclei. And this is also going to be things like typing, or driving a car, riding a bike, things that you learn to do without even thinking. Muscle memory, right? If you're a golfer, you need to get muscle memories that you swing the same every single time. And so this is going to be your basal nuclei talking. If you go to swing, you don't want to think about what you're doing. You want to just do it. And your basal nuclei know what you do when you just do it. And so these are connected to the other parts of your brain. The other parts of your brain are going to do thinking, deciding what to do and when to do it. But the basal nuclei are going to be kind of the last step. They're really going to be the last connection 
between these thought points and the signal actually going out to your muscles. Cerebellum, we said, also played a very important part in motor control. This is going to be a lot of the things that we do without thinking also. Things like posture are going to be controlled by your cerebellum. This is going to be our coordination. And so if I want to catch some, a, a ball that someone throws at me, I need to catch it with both hands. If my cerebellum is not working, maybe one hand goes up here, the other one goes down here, and I get smacked in the face. The cerebellum needs to work to control those movements, the coordination. If I need to walk along a, a tightrope or something, which I cannot do, but if I need to, that coordination is going to be based on your cerebellum. That brings us to that language, to the Wernicke and the Broca areas. So the Wernicke area was in the back. It was posterior to the lateral sulcus. It's usually in the left hemisphere. Why do you think it says usually in the left hemisphere? Bingo. <laughs> Why would it be more often in the left hemisphere than the right hemisphere? It's only in one hemisphere in each of us. In most of us, it's in the left. <coughs> Some of us, it's in the right. What's different between left and right amongst us? We're either left-handed or right-handed, right? And so what do you know about which side of the brain controls which side of your body? It crosses, right? And so the left side of my brain, I'm right-handed, the left side of my brain controlling the right side of my body. The left side of my brain is the dominant side of my brain. The dominant side of your brain is going to be where this language happens. So for most of us that are right-handed, these two areas are going to be on the left side of our brain. If there are any left-handed people in here, that's going to be on the right-hand side of the brain. Yeah? What about people who are ambidextrous? Honestly, don't know. <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I, would, I would imagine it's on one side or the other. I would imagine it's probably not on both. Because then they would probably be like writing the great American novel or something. They would <laughs> double, the, double the power. So the Wernicke area is going to be receiving. It's going to be understanding spoken and written language. And then it's going to take that idea, decide what we want to say, send that to the Broca area. And so imagine the Wernicke area is like the speech writer for the politician. Then the Broca area is the politician who has no idea what he's going to say, or she, until he gets up, or she, I just have a certain politician in mind, standing in front of, of a podium, reading off a teleprompter. Right? Whatever comes up on that teleprompter, that politician is going to say. The Wernicke area is the brains of the process. The Broca area is the one who says it. They know how to say it in order to get other people to understand it. The Wernicke area comes up with the idea that we want to transmit to another person through language. The Broca area is the one that's going to tell the muscles in my body what to do, whether that be my mouth to speak it or my hand to write it. The Broca area is going to actually carry out that language. Take another break. Let's start at 8 o'clock on that clock.
among Gill studying that is mostly a diagram actually called the cortical homunculus, which is basically the size of these yeah. corresponds with the size of those. Mm -hmm. And they make something that looks kind of like that. And I hope you don't like sleeping tonight. That's what it looks like in here. Mm. So the hands are disproportionately big because a lot of our brain folds. The biggest one is like our hands. Mm. And mouth and eyes. Strange. Yeah, very strange. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm not going to spend time on these training layers. There's a bunch of slides for them. You just need to know of the 12 pairs what each pair controls. Okay? That's what you need to know out of this. And there really isn't much more to it than that. You're not going to see a diagram like this on the exam. This is not going to be on the final exam. And so you don't need to be able to pick them out like you did on the lab exam. You need to know which cranial nerves control which things. So I'm going to fly through these. And we end up at the spinal cord, which we already talked about. We are brown again. And so remember that the spinal cord is used and really has two purposes. It's going to conduct information from our limbs, our, our body, up to our brain. It's going to take motor signals from our brain down to our body. But it's also going to do some of that neural integration itself. So things like reflexes are going to just go from our, from our muscles, our limbs, to our spinal cord and then back out. The spinal cord is actually going to make sense of it. Spinal cord is also going to do some of our very, very basic movements, like walking and our reflexes. And so remember, the spinal cord is in our vertebral canal, in our vertebrae, but it does not come all the way down. The spinal cord does not come all the way down our spine. And there are a bunch of spinal nerves coming off of our, our, our spinal cord. <coughs> so if we look at our spine, we have the spinal cord running through it, and then it kind of stops right in...